super sleepy this morning. That seems to be the vibe. But that's okay. We are here. It's a new day. The Lord has woken us up this morning. And so I'm glad that you're with us. I'm going to invite you guys to stand as we come into worship. And let's just lift up this song of our resolve, our resolve to give God honor and glory regardless of what circumstances look like. Let's lift that up this morning.
sing your praise this morning, Jesus. We thank you that you are our living hope, that you are the king who has victory. It's just good to be in your presence this morning, God. We bring you our storms, we bring you the things that are challenging us this morning. Before we ask you to do anything with them, we just ask that you would do something new in us.
Oh 
friends, you may be seated this morning. We welcome you uh, to the journey. We welcome you to our church. And thank you for being here with us this morning on this absolutely beautiful, gorgeous morning. But a morning that we can worship, a morning that we can center ourselves on God. And so thank you for being here, a part of this worship, a part of this refining that we've just been singing together. It acknowledges that all of us are in a spirit, in a space where we might need refined. And we love at the journey that all people are welcomed here. All people are welcomed here to experience the liberation and refinement of Jesus. So no matter who you love, no matter what you did last night, no matter what you did this week, no matter what you planned to do today, no matter if you live on the East Shore, West Shore, North Shore, South Shore, wherever you live, wherever you come from, even as we sing those songs, as Diana was leading us, that refining, regardless of what you think about that refining, even if you're open or not this morning, we're grateful that you are here to be open to the Word and open to the Spirit of God this morning. I just want to share one thing, and I'm going to read scripture and pray for us. I invite you to pray for one of our leaders of our church. I'm not going to name uh, his name at this point. Um, just received some pretty difficult news this week um, in his family. Uh, and so as we pray, um, I'm going to invite you as we pray just to pray for this person who's in leadership here, who's experiencing some pretty difficult pain in his life. And I'm going to invite us as a community to be praying uh, for him. <laughs> But the scripture that I, I thought about this morning as we were singing is that the reason we sing every week, the reason that we have creative expressions of art, the reason that we hear scripture read and, and sermons preached really remind me of Psalm 100. In your feet now applaud God, bring the gift of laughter, send yourselves into his presence. Know this, God is God. God, he made us, we didn't make him, we're his people, his well-tended sheep. Enter with the password, thank you. Make yourselves at home. Talking praise. Thank God. Worship God. For God is sheer beauty, all generous in love, loyal always and ever. Let us pray together. God, you are our creator and we are your well-tended sheep. And so God, we enter this space Knowing, God, that people are doing all kinds of things this morning, and, and, and that's an act of worship this morning, and, and out in nature, and the beauty, and the space, and, and spaces like this all across our city and world, God, that, that we can be here, and that we can thank you, that we can worship you, that we can bring praise to you, because you are our creator, and we are your tended sheep. And so, God, even in this space this morning, God, as we speak and pray about being refined, about burning new within us, purifying us, God, may we be open to the leading of your spirit. May we be open to the words that Pastor Shannon will bring. May we be open to the scripture that's allowed. May we be open to be people who are maybe a little bit more loving, less judgmental, forgiving. So God, this morning I pray for a leader in our church who's just experiencing some pain and, and honestly, God, experiencing just a bit of uncertainty. God, we pray for the medical people who are helping him and his family. We pray, God, we don't even, might not know what to pray for, but God, we just pray for your spirit. God, would you care and tend this family? May even, God, in this moment, as as this family travels and experiencing medical help elsewhere, God, would, would they sense your peace and your love right now because of this body? Offer pray, prayer and hope for them. So God, may we be open this day. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Uh, Shannon, 
I'm one of the pastors here at The Journey. And uh, right now we're doing this series called Jesus and Women. And um, last week, Dr. Rebecca Harris kicked us off um, talking about Mary Magdalene and her story and ways that we've never seen or talked about Mary Magdalene often in the church before. Um, and she really was the, the forefront of the church and I just love that. And um, this morning we wanna continue with the series of Jesus and women because I love Jesus's relationship with women in the Bible. And I love it and I push for the series because I really wanna uh, bring this forth more in the church. Um, so one of the stories I wanted to share this morning is out of John chapter four. And we all know this story, um, if you grew up in church, if you didn't, we're gonna talk about it this morning. Um, but we all know this story, we know her. Um, we don't know her name, but she's called the woman of the well, or woman at the well. And Jesus has this encounter um, with this woman where he discusses theology with a person that could often be categorized as the lowest of the low on their social demographic continuum. She's usually talked about with condemnation. Um, I've been at church since I was hanging on the back of a pew. Um, how many people are under the age of 30? Anyone? Okay. Pews are these long wooden benches <laughs> that we in church. Really uncomfortable. We have these nice cushy chairs now, but we, we grew up with pews. I kid, I kid. You all know what pews are. But uh, since I grew up in the church, um, sitting on a pew, we talked about this woman, often in disparaging terms. She's this sleazy woman who's been married five times and now living with a man who's not her husband. She's not talked about in great terms. But conservative New Testament scholars will tell you that that's probably not at all the case. Um, because marriage in the first century was a huge deal. It was a legal agreement. It denoted property disbursement. So it's a huge deal in the first century for a man to give a woman a certificate of marriage. He might have taken her to dinner. He might have taken her to a hotel down the street, to a Holiday Inn Express and had his way with her. But he wouldn't have married her. And so the fact that this woman is married four more times after her first husband is a big deal. And so it talks more about her character than her lack thereof. New Testament scholars will tell you that she most likely struggled with infertility, which is one of the most common reasons for divorce in the first century. She probably has amazing character. She's probably very beautiful. And this is probably one of the only reasons that plausibly explains why four more men, after the first, would have stepped over societal propriety and saying, I'll marry her too. So she's married the first time. She's probably about the age of 12. And she's married to a man that's probably in his mid-30s. Can you imagine that, being 12 years old, coming to the aisle and saying, I don't know this man. I think he probably does business with my father. But this is now my life. This is now what I'm going to walk into. I hope it works out. I hope it goes well. And then it doesn't and he kicks her to the curb, most likely because she can't have children. And then it happens again, and she thinks, well, maybe, maybe this time will work out, maybe we'll make it work, maybe we can adopt, maybe this time will be better. And it doesn't. And it happens first time, second time, third time, fourth time, and fifth time. And now she's living with a man who's not her husband. And she's in the middle of the day, avoiding conversation with other women, avoiding the side eye that she's probably getting. She's been marginalized, but she's probably been marginalized for something that she didn't even do. So she's broken. And in the beginning of John chapter four, which we're gonna read in a moment, there's this beautiful nugget that we miss because we often get into the conversation of this woman at the well and the conversation that she's having with Jesus and all this back and forth, but we miss a small little nugget and to see how Jesus set this up, how God set this up before we even get into the conversation. So let's read this. In John chapter four, we're gonna start with verse one and go through verse six. <clears throat> Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. I'm going to pause there for a moment. And he had to pass there through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. 
So I'm gonna come back there for a moment. This moves, that's really great. Look at that. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, squirrel, rabbits, I get distracted easily. So let's come back there for a moment. Verse four, it says, and he had to pass through Samaria. Really? He had to pass through Samaria? Jesus didn't have to pass through Samaria. It wasn't the only route to go there. Actually, Jesus never passed through Samaria. Jesus didn't have to pass through Samaria. This is not a geographical detail. This is the compassion of our Christ. He had to pass through Samaria because he knew it would be at that well. He moves his entire trip, his entire trip to pass through this one spot because he knew he would be there. And he stops. He stops everything to see her. All of her. All of whose society deemed unworthy to see Jesus. He is not dismissive of us. He does not remove himself from us. He doesn't try to trip us up. This is not who he is. He pursues us. And he stops to pursue her. I want to pause there for a moment. And I want to jump into another story. We're going to go through a couple of stories this morning. And in the book of Luke, we're going to go into Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 36. And we all know this, this, woman, this story of this woman, too. And it's the woman who pours the alabaster oil on Jesus' feet with, and wipes it with her tears and her hair. And we're going to walk to that story in a moment. But we've all heard that story again, another story where we don't talk really fondly of this woman in Sunday school. So let's read this for a moment. This one's a longer one, so bear with me as we go through this. Starting in verse, so chapter 7 of Luke, verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he, Jesus, went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman, in this, of, this, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at a table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is, is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. He said, a certain money lender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, we've all read that story before. We've grown up with that story. But I want to walk through this story a little bit longer and read more than sometimes of the details that we usually read. So we have this woman. Do you ever wonder how she got there in the first place? Because we have Simon, he's a Pharisee. And a Pharisee, he's a big leader in the community, he's a big deal. He's probably pretty wealthy, he probably drives a Bentley. Um, he probably lives in a gated community, he's doing well for himself, right? He's this big deal. And so you have Simon, who has this really nice house, and you have this woman who is referred to as a sinner in the city, which scholars will tell you that means she worked at night. So how did this woman of this reputation get to a Pharisee's house? Some preachers say that it's most, most likely that she's been there before, um, but that's just conjecture. There's no basis to that. Um, here's a better exegesis. Um, during the first century, if you were a wealthy man like Simon, you would have dinner parties outside. It was very common. The, the weather in the Middle East was really nice. I've never been there, but I hear it's really nice. Um, if you, you, the weather is very consistent. It's not like here in Pennsylvania where you wake up and it's raining and snowing, and then by summer or by evening you're in your swimming pool. Um, it's very consistent where the weather is just always constant, right? Very nice weather. So they had dinner parties outside all the time. 
And wealthy people um, would have their dinner parties outside, but they would have um, like a gated uh, patio wall around their yard. So Simon is having this dinner party outside. And um, what's common in that culture were people who were not invited to that party. Um, they would come and they would lean against the patio, the courtyard wall and they would eavesdrop on the conversation because they didn't have Twitter, they didn't have Facebook, they didn't have Instagram. So that's how they knew what was going on around the community as what was going on in that dinner party. And scholars would tell you that this woman who Luke said was a sinner in the city most likely came with several other people to kind of eavesdrop on that conversation that was going on at the dinner. We also definitively know that there were only men at that table because during the first century in and at this time, all eating was segregated. So only men sat at the table where women and children sat in other places. So this was a men's only type of dinner. We also know they weren't sitting at chairs. So just kind of painting a picture for you here. Uh, tables uh, were, not, were not like, you guys know the, the painting of the Last Supper where you have Jesus sitting at that table with all the disciples? It's inaccurate because that's not what tables looked like. They were actually pretty low, more like a coffee table, and they sat at cushions around the table. So that's what's going on at this dinner party. And they're sitting there, and then also, they're not sitting at chairs, they're on the ground, but also, Jesus says he's leaning. So he's most likely leaning on his left hip and his left elbow, because the right hand is considered clean, the left hand is considered unclean. So he's leaning on his left. If you go and you greet your Jewish, your Jewish friends, they'll most likely greet you with the right hand, because the left hand, they will greet you with the right hand because the left hand is considered unclean. That's why we also in the Bible read that Jesus sat at the left, or sat at the right hand of God the Father and not the left. Um, so we know that that's how he's eating, so stay with me on this. He's leaning on his right hand, he's leaning on his left, um, on his left elbow, left hip, and he's eating with his right hand. Most likely, we don't know what he's eating, but we'll just go with like hummus and pita, because I really like hummus and pita, and that sounds really, really good. So that's what he's eating as he's in this dinner conversation. We also know that Jesus' feet would have been as far away from the food as possible. And how do we know that? Because feet are considered filthy at this time, and rightfully so. Uh, there's no paved roads, so that everywhere they go, they're walking in dirt and in sand. So feet are considered filthy. Sometimes they're still considered filthy right now. Depends on how you like that go that route. But anyways, um, feet were considered filthy, so they kept them as far away from the food as possible. So you follow me here with this picture, right? Okay, so I want to go back to where Luke is saying that she was a sinner in the city. Luke gives a lot of detail in his writing. Um, he was a physician first, um, before he you know, chose his second act. And then also, Luke writes in a lot of detail, I think, because he is the only uh, non-Jew, non he's a Gentile. So he often gives uh, a description of what things were like from an outsider's point of view. And so he's explaining uh, this, this woman, and he uses the term a sinner from the city. And what he's effectively trying to say is that she is most likely a trafficking victim. Because in Roman history in the first century, Roman ran, Rome ran out of cash. And because Rome had spent too much money, they couldn't afford to pay their military. So here's what happened. So Rome tells her soldiers, uh, your checks are going to bounce, and we can't afford to pay you, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to make a deal with you. We are going to let you go to any of the other people groups, and we're going to allow you to plunder, which means you get to rape, pillage, and plunder those areas. And you can take anything that they have, and that will kind of suffice as your pay, since we can't afford to pay you. And if you want to, after you kill all the, all the boys or all the men, that are over the age of 12, you can take all of the women and all of the children and you can employ them as trafficking victims. And the modern scholars will tell you that on record, most people that worked in solicitation were trafficking victims. Every single woman that I've ever encountered that has walked this life um, with solicitation on her record, not one single one of them has ever asked when they were little for a prostitution barbie. It's not a thing that they want. But what usually happened was when they were five years old, they were sexually abused by someone who was supposed to keep them safe. So they're left broken with a distorted view of self and a distorted view of love. So we have this woman who Luke describes as a sinner in the city. 
She didn't dream of this when she was little. She was probably ripped from her village, from her family, and taken to a big city and forced into prostitution, which meant now she's considered filthy, unmarriable, probably gets the side eye every time she goes out, and everyone just looks at her as though she is filthy. But she comes to this dinner party, right? And Luke is trying to explain how everyone is thinking about this woman that's in this party. And Simon, he says, if Jesus, he's saying to Jesus, if Jesus, Yeshua, if you had, had been as big of a deal as people say you are, this big prophet, then you would have known what kind of woman this was. She's trash. I mean, look at her. And we've often taught this message in this vein and painted this picture of this woman and this little miniskirt and this tube top and that she's a seductress prostitute. But Luke is saying she's broken. She's so broken, yet she's so brave. She knew they would judge her. She knew, that she, she knew if she came into this space that they would give her the side eye. She knew that she came to this dinner party that this is how she would be treated. And Simon says, yeah, Jesus, if you, if you were such a big deal, you should have known. And do you know what Jesus does next? He says to Simon, he says, Simon, I came into your house. And common, common courtesy dictates that you would have had a basin of water by the door to wash my feet. Everyone does that. But you had nothing. Common courtesy is that you would have had some way for my feet to be clean, yet this woman has not stopped washing my feet with her tears. Stop and think about that for just a quick moment. She's washing Jesus' feet with her tears. I've cried a lot in my life, probably too much. Um, but I remember one time I was crying, I was on the floor, I was in a really just a really heavy space in life. And I was just weeping on the ground. And after a long period of time just crying, I looked up and there's a small little pool of water on the floor. For after a long time of weeping. And here she is, just weeping, producing enough tears to actually wash Jesus' feet with her tears. And that's what I think of when I read this story. She's so overwhelmed. She gets close to the wall, his feet are near her. She's just so overwhelmed that she gets close to his feet and just begins to weep on his feet with her tears. And then she takes her hair down. And to take your hair down in the first century in the Middle East, you just don't do that. That's considered extremely provocative. And the only time a woman over the age of 12 would take her hair down in public, with, or take her hair down at all, was in the privacy of her bedroom with her husband. And she does that, and Simon just loses it. And the crowd of people are gasping. People are just beside themselves that this is happen, happening. And Simon is like, if you knew what kind of piece of trash this woman is, and yet she's just drying Jesus' feet with her hair. She takes this small flask, this alabaster jar that she carries around her neck, and it's filled with perfumed oil. And that's often what women who worked at night, what they did was they carried a perfumed oil around their neck. And there's different reasons I, I've read, but um, some of them was just because the smells of working with men at night was just overwhelming. And they, she had this, this, this flask of perfumed oil, probably the most expensive thing she owned. And she just pours it on Jesus' feet. She's just undone. And this is considered scandalous at the time in this culture. Yet she just pours it on him because her scandal was her worship. She's just undone. But don't you know, she must have met him before. I think she did. Because if you reach Luke chapter 7, if you go up just a, a tiny bit up, you read this other story about the woman of Nain. And this is a, a story sometimes we read over quickly. But um, we have this woman of Nain, and she's a widow. She had lost her husband, but now she had just lost her only son, her only child. And she's walking next to the pallbearers who are carrying his casket, and they're going out of the city, and Jesus is coming into the city. And she's just walking past them, just grieving. And Jesus is coming into town and walking toward them, and she, she doesn't look up at Jesus. She doesn't pour oil on his feet. She doesn't ask for prayer. All she is doing is just putting one foot in front of the other. She's grieving. She can barely put one foot in front of the other. And she's thinking, as they might as well just put me in the ground with him because how can I go on? I've lost my husband and now I've lost my only child. I just can't do this. And it says, Jesus sees her. And do you know what it says? It says he bridges the gap between himself and this grieving woman. 
She didn't come to a church service. She didn't get the free t-shirt. She didn't raise her hands in worship. She doesn't, not, she doesn't even acknowledge that Jesus is next to her. She's barely getting one foot in front of the other. But it says he bridges the gap between him and her and that he is moved with compassion. And in the original text, in the original Greek, that word right there for compassion is, I'm going to say this, phlegnitsima, which means, it's actually where we get the word spleen. It means it was a gut level compassion. That he was moved by compassion from his gut. He does not look at her pain and says, figure it out. He doesn't look at her pain and said, pull yourself up from your bootstraps. No, instead he says, come closer. And he's moved with this gut level compassion for this woman. And he says he walks towards this woman and he looks at her and he says, don't cry. And then it says he reaches up. He takes her dead boy's hand and he raises that child back to life. This happens right before this dinner party with Simon. I wonder if she saw that. I wonder if she said, oh my goodness, I have never seen a holy man that kind. I wonder if she saw that and she followed follow me here verse 44 it says that they're having this interaction back at the dinner party and it says that that jesus is having this interaction with simon and simon's just just speaking to him you should have seen this woman and he says gazing at the woman jesus addresses simon in the original greek he doesn't look away from her Stop and consider that for a moment, right? Everyone else is judging her. All the men, if they look at her at all, is just with lust in their eyes. Yet as he's addressing Simon over here, he doesn't stop gazing at this woman. She's been stigmatized, marginalized, judged, and Jesus just gazes at her. He just sees her. As he's addressing Simon, he doesn't look away and just sees her. The kindness, the compassion of Jesus to each of these women. He stops everything, tramples on societal propriety to see each of these women. I'm going to close with this. I once heard someone say that the gospel is like the Cinderella story. Hmm. It's not. It's not at all. Because we know the Cinderella story, right? Everyone, you've seen it, you've read it, you've watched the movie, right? And in the Cinderella story, Cinderella, she deserves the prince. She's beautiful. She's got probably high metabolism, fits in those skinny white jeans, really nice, right? She looks great. She loves animals, even rodents, right? She's so nice to them. She sings so good. She cleans really well. She's a good person, right? She deserves the prince. And, and at the end of the story, when that slipper fits on that shoe, you're like, yes, the good girl got the good guy, right? Perfection, that's the story, right? That's not the gospel. The gospel is the stepsister. She's not been on that keto diet. She's got a bit of a crooked nose, big mole on her face, right? Not quite as pretty. She's probably in polyester with big wide horizontal stripes, right? Not looking quite right. She probably has a little bit of an odor. I don't know, her hair is a big hot mess. And she comes to this first dance and everyone's like, whoa, that child needs some help, right? She's been stigmatized. She's unkind, but she's probably broken. And here comes this prince, right? He's beautiful, he's breathtaking, he's compelling, and everyone just wants to step towards him. They're compelled by him, they want to get closer to him, right? And without hesitating, the prince walks right to the stepsister, and he says, would you like to dance? And the whole crowd just gasps because it's <laughs> ridiculous. But here's the deal. When he, she steps into his arms, she immediately feels beautiful. We, she takes all of those things that made her feel marginalized, that made her feel less than, that made her feel anything but, and she's just overwhelmed by him. That's the gospel. This morning I shared just a handful of stories of women in the gospels that time after time where women have been marginalized, Jesus every single time steps into the gap to call them out, that what everyone else had to say about them, he called them out and says, I see you and you're beautiful and you are seen and you are invited to the table. We don't know these women's names, but we know their stories. We tell them over and over again, sometimes incorrectly, because society has deemed them as less than, but Jesus always pushes them to the front. 
for society so that each of these women weren't allowed us at a seat of the table, he says, come closer. Because that's the compassion of our Savior. That's who our Jesus is. I read these stories and I'm overwhelmed by his compassion, but I look at my own story and I look at stories of women around me. And I always, always see the compassion of our Savior. And it took me a really long time to believe not only does he chase me, not only does he pursue me, but he delights in me. And like the Song of Solomon says, with one glance of my eyes, I've captured his heart. Not because of my character, not because of my backstory, not because of his mercy, or because of his mercy and because of his grace. These women have been pushed aside time after time, and they're not only not invited to the table, but there is no table for them. But our Savior, on our darkest days, he simply says, I see you, and he stops everything. He changes his route. He stops those who see you, but anything but less than. And he breaks the box, shatters the propriety to come closer. He says, if you don't have a seat at the table, I've created a table for you, and here's your seat, because that's our Savior, and that's the gospel. Let me pray. Father, this morning, we thank you for who you are and magnificent of who you are. And that you see us, that you see each person in this room, that you see each person, no matter the backstory, no matter how they got here, no matter what they did last night, God, you see us. And you continue to pursue us and chase us and stop everything to call us out by name. Lord, this morning, I just pray for each person here, God, that they are seen by you, that they feel known by you. That no matter the circumstance, God, that you have called them by name, you see the beautiful person in this room. God, when we know you in a greater way and know your heart for each person, not only for ourselves, but for the person sitting right next to me. May I see them through your eyes, God, and the beauty that you carry for each person here. Thank you, Father, that you are doing a new thing. In your name I pray. Amen.
Richard Purcell, uh, Giovanni from Messiah University, uh, Brittany Ross Davis, and myself. We'll so be having some conversation around mental health and uh, what that looks like in uh, black and brown communities, what, what that looks like for persons who've experienced significant mental health concerns since COVID, and just the stigma of the conversation. Uh, and so we'll be having that tomorrow. It will be uh, on our Facebook and YouTube, uh, and there's a link uh, if you want that as well. And so uh, may you tune in and be a part of that conversation tomorrow. And so the journey is this Wednesday for persons who are looking to know a little bit more about me, about our church. That's a helpful next step. There's information in your handout as well. But I'm grateful that if, if generosity is a part of your act of worship, I thank you. Now, uh, for your generosity to our church, and there's ways to give on the screen and bask in the back and information in the hand as well. I'm going to give the benefit, my own benediction. Um, often the church, we, we mess this up um, in our relationship with, with how the church sees women, or how we even talk about how God sees women and Jesus sees women. And I love that this we can just share out of who Jesus is. And so I just want to pray over each of you this morning and give a benediction. And Father, we just thank you again for each person here. That we may go this week, this moment, this day ahead of us, God, knowing that you see us. Not only do you see us, not only do you chase us and pursue us, but you delight in us. And you push us forward and you tell us to keep going because you have a seat at the table. May each of you go this week being blessed with his love, his mercy, and his grace. And may it shine upon you this week and as you go forth. In your name I pray. Amen.